Okay, look, this is not how I usually start my videos, but here's the thing. I don't own a copy of this movie physically, and also I want to explicitly state that the title of this video is true. I did actually assume that the first time I watched this movie and it was subsequently taken off of Netflix like a day or two later, that I really did imagine this whole thing. I really did assume that I hallucinated a whole film. Let's get into it. Hello everyone, welcome back to Medley in Antiquity. My name is Trey and today we're going to be covering the 1998 film Velvet Goldmine directed by Todd Haynes. So first I want to kind of get into the film itself. So Velvet Goldmine came out in 1998 and it was a film that was based ma mainly on the life of David Bowie. But David Bowie hated the idea of this film so much that he refused to license any of his music for the film despite the fact that the film's title is taken directly from Bowie's song, Velvet Goldmine. Um, it's a, I love the movie. I think it's fun. Um, David did not feel the same way about it. And I think to the day he died, he never watched it. He point blank refused to watch this movie at all. So let's talk about kind of who worked on the film because the two things the two biggest people on the crew that I want to cover are the director Todd Haynes and the costume designer Sandy Powell. So Todd Haynes most people will know is the guy who directed Carol. Uh, he's also who people credit with kind of pioneering the new queer cinema movement in the 90s. Um, a lot of his films have revolved around music and pop culture. Um, he's directed things like obviously Carol, uh, I'm Not Here, the Bob Dylan Docu the Do Bob Dylan mockumentary, I guess you could call it, as well as the new film Dark Waters starring Mark Ruffalo. So a lot of his films are very much based on uh, activism or pop culture, which is something that's really interesting. And Todd Haynes himself is a ex openly queer man. So it's really cool to see a queer person directing queer content. And now let's get into the costume designer, Sandy Powell. So Sandy Powell is kind of the mastermind behind every cool costume you've ever seen. She was the costume designer for Interview with the Vampire. Uh, she was the costume designer for Disney's live action Cinderella remake, as well as the costume designer for Mary Poppins Returns. So obviously you can see that a lot of the costumes she does are very big and loud and colorful and beautiful, which is why you have to give her a lot of credit for this film because all of these costumes, um, after looking into the film, she took pictures of David Bowie's stage costumes and replicated them from the pictures alone. And that takes a huge amount of work. It takes a huge amount of practice of her craft. And it shows that the costumes in the film themselves really show exactly how dedicated she was to making this film as accurate and truthful to the characters as possible. Now let's kind of get into the cast of the film because the cast might surprise some of you. It is my belief that to understand a story, you have to understand the characters that are in that story. So before I get into the actual meat of what this movie is, I wanna kind of go through the cast. And I'm only gonna be talking about a select couple people in the story, and that'll be our three main characters, Arthur Stewart, Brian Slade, and Kurt Wilde. So first let me have Arthur, who is our main character. He's the one who narrates most of the story and everything that's happening is happening in flashbacks that are either told to him and or flashbacks that we're seeing from his personal life growing up in the mid to the early mid late 70s. And Arthur is played by Christian Bale, um, a younger, a young Christian Bale, which obviously because the movie was made in 98 but you have, and it's a very good performance. So he plays this character who grew up loving glam rock in the 70s, who comes out, who was outed as gay to his parents and then is forced to leave his home and kind of makes his way through this groupie circle in the 70s following around our lead character, Brian Slade. And it's his, essentially we see not only Arthur's life as a journalist, in 1984, which is where we kind of see these cycles back, everything cycles back to, we also see Arthur coming of age through 1974 to 1976. 
And next we have Brian Slade, who is played by Jonathan Rhys Myers. Um, and this, it's very much a larger than life character. And it's a role that despite the fact that it's kind of a film about him, I mean, a lot of the time he's really omnipresent. It's, you don't ever really see this real person, which is interesting. And I think is a very cool way to do it. You never see the real Brian. You always see this kind of imagination that, that Brian has of himself or this idealized version of Brian that is him as Maxwell Demon. Um, and it's a, it's such an interesting way to play it because it's kind of exploring these phases of David Bowie's life as if they are entirely separate people. And this kind of devolving of his mental and emotional state into thinking that he is something other than human. And then from there, we go into um, Brian's love interest, Kurt Wilde, Wilde with an E. You know what that means. If, if you know, you know, Wilde with an E. Um, who is played lovingly, reverently, and beautifully by none other than Obi-Wan Kenobi himself, Ewan McGregor. Um, and this is, this is a role that I think a lot of people take for granted in Ewan McGregor's extensive filmography, because I personally really enjoy his character in this. He plays a character who is heavily inspired by Iggy Pop, which is very fun because it's Ewan McGregor playing a character inspired by Iggy Pop. So as you can imagine, it gets interesting. There's a very particular scene in which he performs a cover of TV Eye, where he covers himself in baby oil and glitter and takes off his pants. They filmed that in one take. It's one of the best scenes in the movie. It's also very fun to watch. Um, but Ewan McGregor in this film is phenomenal. He really takes, he took so much care with this character and with this character's struggles with drugs and substance abuse. And I think it's a really good, it's a testament to how wonderful of an, and good of an actor he is that he was able to play this part so respectfully. Um, and yeah, and from there, let's kind of move on to the plot of the film and a bit of the meat and about what I've kind of analyzed out of this film in the many, many times that I've watched it. So as I mentioned in the introduction, I was, upon the first time I watched this film under the impression that I had in fact imagined the whole thing. Because I watched it when I probably should not have watched it. It was on Netflix. I thought it looked cool. I saw Velvet Goldmine. I saw Inspired by David Bowie. And my little high school brain went, ooh, David Bowie, I've watched Labyrinth before. This should be fun. And what I was treated to was what felt like a, like a bubblegum flavored acid trip with no David Bowie music. Which is interesting that they were telling a David Bowie story without have, without being able to use any of his music. But the music they were able to use is this very interesting mix of actual bands from the 70s. So you've got songs by T-Rex, you've got songs by Lou Reed, you've got songs by Roxy Music. But then you also have bands like Shudder to Think and Placebo covering songs from the 70s, from the era which is interesting because Placebo was actually in the film, which is really fun to watch because they play this very fun group of people that our main character, Arthur, actually ends up living with for a time after he leaves his parents' home. So it, and on top of being a David Bowie story with no actual David Bowie music, um, there's also a very interesting plot point that is never actually explained, and that is... Um, Oscar Wilde and Aliens. I, there's a decent chunk of the film that is comprised of Oscar Wilde quotes because there's a very marked connection between a very specific pin that is part of the costuming that comes from Oscar Wilde who is apparently dropped off on the doorstep of his family's homes by a spaceship uh, that ends up in the hands of Jack Ferry who is a very interesting character and is actually a very beautiful depiction of gender fluidity or transness in the film, which that pin is then stolen 
from Jack by Brian, who eventually gives it to Kurt Wilde, who eventually gives it to our main character Arthur at the end of the film. It's never explained exactly what the significance of this pin is, or really the whole connection to Oscar Wilde at all is really not explained with the exception of Kurt's last name being spelled the same way, which should say something. Yeah, anyway, so the timeline of the film is really interesting because a lot of how they denote the timeline is done through the color palette and how the movie is filmed. So in the very, in the early, early part of the film, um, Arthur is, is assigned to do a story on Brian Slade, whatever happened to Brian Slade, because the premise of the film is Brian is doing this, or Brian has kind of disappeared. And Arthur is assigned to do a kind of what happened piece to him because in 1974, Brian Slade faked his own death by having a fake shooting hoax where he is shot to death on stage at the beginning of one of his concerts at which Arthur was present. So it's very much a resurgence of everything that Arthur has tried to push away in his life coming back up. But how they film it is you have 1984, everything's very bleak, everything's a very gray washed out color palette. And then you go to the late 60s, 1968, 1969, which is where we meet Brian for the first time through the eyes of his former manager, Cecil. And it's kind of very, it's very pale, but there's color, it's there's life in it. Uh, then you move on further to 1974 and everything is very bright and very vibrant and very alive. And then 1976, you move towards the darkness because it's this it's the death of glitter. It's the end of glam rock as we know it and the beginning of punk and the beginning of hardcore rock. And it's very it's darker, it's grungier, it's grittier, but there is still that color there. And I think the color palette is a really beautiful way in how they kind of denote exactly what's happening in the film at the time. Um, next, we kind of get into the idea behind the film and because the film is very it's almost confusing in a way if you watch it just one time you have to watch it a couple times to really understand exactly what's happening but my takeaway from the film is that it's not about Brian it's about Kurt and Arthur finding their way back to each other because there's a very poignant moment in the film in the within the first like five to ten minutes of the film that I think really kind of explains exactly what the film is about. Um, and it happens at this really interesting moment that's kind of almost a throwaway moment unless you're actually paying attention to what's being said, uh, where Arthur and Kurt cross paths in a subway station as Arthur is going down and Kurt is coming out of it. And it's it's a very full circle moment because um in the film itself in the end towards the end of the film we see that Kurt and Arthur have had a had an encounter um of the intimate kind on a rooftop during the death of glitter concert and had not seen each other since that moment so it's a very very much kind of a full circle thing and I think that's really denoted by this line from Arthur it's a narration line that he has right before he kind of goes into recollecting his own beginnings of his love of glam rock and it is why is it suddenly up to me to figure it out clearly there was something something from the past is spooking me back I didn't realize at the time it was you and he says this directly as he is walking and he makes eye contact with Kurt so that kind of really put the whole film into perspective for me. And I was like, oh, this isn't about Brian. This isn't about Mandy. This isn't about Cecil. This isn't about anybody at all except Kurt and Arthur. This is a story of Kurt and Arthur in the most roundabout way possible. It is about two people who I don't even really know if you could call it falling in love but who met and who connected so intimately that this whole movie had, to, this whole narrative had to be constructed to bring them back to each other. And 
the most literal sense because they had not seen each other in almost 10 years. So for me, the film is in a very unusual way about two people who might or may not be in love trying to find each other and seeing if they can figure out exactly what they mean to the other person. And I think that's a very beautiful way to structure a film, a very beautiful and very fun way, but still a way that's very kind of poignant and very relevant, really. Especially now, when we really do need it. Uh, so that's kind of my analysis of the film and a little bit of the fun facts about it and the content matter. So now we'll kind of do final thoughts. All right, so final thoughts on Velvet Goldmine are that you cannot watch this film just once and expect to understand anything that is happening. It's kind of one of those films you have to watch a few times to really understand and honestly it took me god I think five or six times to even really suss out the fact that this isn't a film about Brian this is a film about Kurt and Arthur uh if that tells you anything and I love this movie to death I it's a beautiful film it's I think it's probably one of Todd Haynes most underrated pieces um it's incredible the acting is phenomenal um everyone in the film was so dedicated to making this movie as accurate to the experience as possible the music the soundtrack is incredible i really do recommend checking out what you can of the soundtrack most of it has been stripped from spotify uh the whole album is not available on um on any sort of streaming service. Trust me, I looked. I do pretty much download all of the songs off of YouTube. Um, it's, but it's a really good movie, especially, and I think it's an important film to watch if you are a young queer person who kind of wants to see a film where not only is your sexuality expressed, um, but is expressed respectfully and where they explicitly talk about being bisexual. There's a lot of talk about characters being bisexual. They actually, I'm not sure they explicitly use the word, I don't remember, but there's characters who are obviously bisexual, there are characters who are obviously gay, there is one character who is obviously trans or genderqueer. And I think that really speaks to Todd Haynes as the father of the new queer cinema movement. Um, and it's it's a film that's about a young gay man kind of discovering and coming to terms with a lot of his trauma that he's been dealing with for years and a lot of kind of repressed feelings about this person that he felt this deep connection with and i think that's very important so i do recommend the film i purchased my copy off of itunes um I believe it is on available on Amazon. It is no longer on Netflix. It was on Netflix for a brief glimmer and then it disappeared, which is why I thought I hallucinated the whole movie. Um, but I believe iTunes, I know, does have it for rent and for purchase. You would have to check on Amazon. I have not checked because I have not had the need to, but it is an important film. If you are young, gay, and like David Bowie, which most of you should, uh, you should probably watch this movie and you'll probably enjoy the heck out of it. So that's it for our first episode of One Off Wonders and I will see everybody on Monday for our next episode of Market Music.